Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 113, The Council at Antioch in 341. Continuously since episode 91, the Trinity's podcast has been all interviews with authors. I'm going to take a little break from that now. I am going to get back to it, don't worry. I already have some other interviews recorded and some others planned. The thing about interviews is I never interview anyone just cold, not having actually read what they've produced. I read the whole thing, and often that's a 300 or more page book. In any case, I've always wanted to cover the important ancient and medieval councils in this podcast. And not only the councils, but other important doctrinal statements and developments to help people understand the flow of the history. So way back in episode two, I did the Athanasian Creed, or I should say the so-called Athanasian Creed, because it's not from Athanasius. Episode 12, I did the Apostles' Creed. That was a fun one. Episode 29 was all devoted to Arius, what can be known about him and his theology. And of course, that leads into episode 30, which is the famous council at Nicaea in 325. And it's not what a lot of people think it is. I'll summarize what went on at that council in just a moment. Episode 31 was devoted to a discussion of Nicaea by my friend William Hasker, the accomplished philosopher of religion. He read us a portion of his book in which he summarizes a lot of recent scholarship devoted to that council and how it overturns some long-standing views and assumptions about it. Ever since then, I've been mean to keep going. And really for the Trinity, the most important council to get to is the council in 381. But I'm not there yet. So in this episode, I'm going to briefly review Nicaea and then talk about the aftermath including this interesting council that met in the year 341. The major understanding of Nicaea is that it was just expressing what Christians had always believed. It was just a slight innovation in language, and that it was the church rising up and stopping kind of a rationalistic, philosophical, speculating new teaching propounded by this horrible man named Arius and a few others. And the church said, enough is enough, we can't take that, we've always believed differently than that. And then they came up with this creed. That's very, very inaccurate. What really happened was this. By this time, mainstream Catholic Christianity already had a long history of subordinationist views about Jesus and God. Views on which Jesus and God are two beings, And God is greater than Jesus. In fact, the Father just is the one true God. And Jesus, as time went on, they increasingly speculated more and more about how he was divine. So they called Jesus God. There were two who were called God. They were clear about what they were doing. They were using the word God ambiguously as a name for the Father, but also as a name for the Son. An earlier view some scholars call two-stage logos theory. Logos from John chapter 1. And this is the view that eternally God had his Logos within him. That's God's reason or wisdom. And then when it came time to create, well, God couldn't create directly because he was too transcendent. This is an idea from Platonic theology that had also been active in Judaism. Famously, Philo of Alexandria teaches this. God can't be directly involved in creation, have direct contact with it, so... First, God has to emanate out kind of an intermediary in between God and creation, and the intermediary is the one who directly does it. So the view was God eternally has his logos within him, that's his wisdom. Then when it comes time to create, God speaks out that word, and at that point, there is now a second agent in existence alongside God, and then that agent does God's bidding, does the creating directly for God, so God doesn't have to get his hands dirty. This is two-stage Logos theory, and some of them imagine this as just two stages in the career of the Logos, but if you look at a careful thinker, someone like Tertullian, he's pretty clear about that the non-human, the pre-human Jesus only exists at that second stage. 
God's wisdom is just a divine attribute. It's not a person in addition to God who can cooperate with God or do what God wants him to do. The spoken word, the expressed word, well, that's another divine spirit like God, but of course not as old as God and dependent on God for all that it has. So on two-stage logos theory, there was a time literally when the Son of God did not exist, although there was God's eternal logos within God. And then when it came time to create, first God brought into existence this logos, and then the logos created for him. This is how they interpret passages in the New Testament, which seem to say that God created all things through Jesus, this lesser divine spirit that goes back to before creation, is thought to be the same person as the man, Jesus. You see this two-stage view in Justin Martyr, famously, and we did a couple episodes on him if you want to hear more about Justin's views and how they embody a two-stage Logos theory and how they show a very strong, surprisingly strong Platonic influence in how he thinks about God and creation. These are episodes 74, 75, and 76. And related to those are 71, 72, 73, which asks the question, is Proverbs 8 about the pre-human Jesus? Proverbs 8 is describing this wisdom that was with God in the beginning and sort of helped God to make the world. Now, the two-stage Logos theory was eclipsed by the one-stage Logos theory. And the first person we know about who explicitly formulated and argued for a one-stage Logos theory was the famous scholar Origen. And if you want to hear more about Origen, you can listen to episode 24 called How to Be a Monotheistic Trinitarian, in which I present a paper that in part concerns Origen's views about God and Jesus. In short, Origen was very clear in his subordinationism. Jesus is a divine being, and for Origen, Jesus is an eternal being. But eternally, this Jesus, the Logos, emanates out of God. He's divine only through something like platonic participation in God. He gets his divinity in as much as he has a kind of divinity from God, but it doesn't make him equal to God, strictly speaking. He is just as old as God because he's always existed, but he's not equal to God in power, goodness, or knowledge. So from this time on, roughly the middle of the 200s, it became most popular in mainstream Catholic thinking to say that the Logos, the pre-human Jesus, had just always been around, but somehow mysteriously generated from the Father. That's not to say that everyone thought that, of course. There was still a memory of the earlier view out there. So what happened with this guy Arius, this presbyter named Arius in the city of Alexandria in Egypt in the 320s, is he got into a quarrel with his bishop Alexander. Arius just had gone too far as a subordinationist. He sort of more strongly emphasized the difference between the father and the son. Origen had called the son a creature of God, although he didn't think that the son or the logos was a creature in precisely the same sense that things in the physical world are creatures of God. But anyway, he used that language of the son. But in Arius's day, you couldn't do that. Arius did call the son a creature, and according to some sources anyway, said that there was a time when the son didn't exist, like the earlier two-stage logos theorists. And he emphasized that the father is greater than the son, and this was just too much for some people. So his bishop got on to him about this, uh, but he resisted. In his mind, he was a traditionalist, and he was just repeating what his teachers had taught him. And the dispute grew and festered to where it was going to cause political problems. So the first Christian, question mark, emperor, Constantine, thought that he had better nip this in the bud before it caused a rift in his empire, and he called together an assembly of bishops from different parts of the empire to settle the matter. And most of them thought they couldn't really go along with Arius' language. So they sided with Alexander, condemned Arius, and composed what has now become an extremely famous creed. And these parts of it were specifically new. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten from the Father, that is, from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. And then also, And those who say, There once was when he was not, and before he was begotten he was not, and that he came to be from things that were not, or from another hypostasis or substance, affirming that the Son of God is subject to change or alteration, these the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes. So they were saying that there never was a time when the Son was not, and furthermore, the Son and the Father have one usia, one essence or substance between them, and the Son came to be out of the usia of the Father. Now what does that mean? It wasn't clear then, it's not clear now. This term, same usia, homo usias, or homo usian, had not been traditionally used in mainstream Christianity. So why did they pick it? Well, contemporary historians are in agreement that the reason they picked that language is because the Arians would not accept it. So it was a purposely ambiguous formula. Its ambiguity meant that different parties could vote in support of the statement while assuming different things about what it meant. And afterwards, they fought quite a bit about it, as we'll hear. But it's not as if the word was a total blank to them. So, usia meant essence in philosophy, the defining features of a thing, although it also might mean the thing itself, which has the features. In a couple of recent blog posts called 10 Steps Towards Getting Less Confused About the Trinity, Number 6, Same Usia, Parts 1 and 2, I explain the things that they might have meant in that time and place by this same Usia claim. And then I argue basically that the point was to emphasize the similarity and in fact the essential similarity between the Father and the Son. So they weren't saying the Father and Son were one God. They weren't affirming anything like the fully developed Trinity doctrine. And the likeness between Father and Son was meant to imply that the Son had always existed and could not properly be called a creature. That's seemingly about all they agreed on, and this leaves many different views in play. It's consistent with things that modern Trinitarians would say, but it's also consistent with things that different kinds of subordinationist Unitarian theologians would say. When we come back, after the 325 Council, what did they think they had done? Now, the thing that's hard for us to understand is what this council and statement meant to them at the time. What it meant to them at the time was Arius had lost. Bishops had met. They had ruled against him in favor of his opponent, Alexander. And that was about it. They didn't think they were defining the Christian faith for all time. They didn't think that they were coming up with a new, brilliant, and eternally helpful formula for Christian belief. There had been councils before, but there hadn't been councils before called by an emperor, so that was something new. This was the first, at least quasi-Christian emperor, and uh, they were all too happy to get in bed with him, many of these bishops. They viewed this as the triumph of Christianity, and not as its corruption. There had been councils of bishops before, assembled to deal with some problem or some doctrinal dispute, but that was kind of conceived to be their purpose. Let's resolve this dispute, let's argue about this teaching, and then we're done. What had never been done before was composing a creed that was normative for all Christians and for all bishops. You see, Christians had been using creeds all along, really. You see many creeds and some things that Paul says, for instance. 
And at least by the late 100s, you have creeds in various parts of the Christian world that somewhat resemble the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and so on. But those creeds were for catechumens. They were for people just coming into the faith. They were things originally used at baptism to see would the person make a full Christian confession at baptism at that point where they're admitted to full membership in the Christian church. The bishops, it was assumed, as overseers of the flock, would just be in agreement about the central features, at least, of Christian teaching and practice. So there had been councils, but they hadn't been viewed in this quasi-legal way as setters of doctrinal precedent, which should be enforced for bishops. So when they finished, they disbanded, and they all just assumed, well, that was kind of it. And in fact, you don't really hear anything about this creed and its statement for about 14 or 15 years after it. But the controversies didn't go away. Subordinationists were many, and they were really the mainstream, and they were troubled by this new language. On the face of it, if you say that son and father are the same usia, that can be a way of saying that they're the same being. So the son just is the father, and the father just is the son. So then it was the father who was crucified. But wait a second, that's not right. They can't be the same being, right? Jesus is the Messiah of God. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. He can't be one of the parties that he's mediating for, right? If he's a mediator, he's someone who stands in between. So there was a broad consensus that it was wrong to collapse father and son into one being. And it sounded like the creed could be doing just that. So people were pretty uncomfortable with it. And they were also aware that the subordinationist element in Christian theology went way back. Look, Jesus just says the Father is greater than he is. And this was acknowledged all around. He also says there are things he doesn't know, whereas the Father knows all. In the Gospel of John, he says it's by the Father's power that he does miracles and that his teaching is given to him from God. All right, so then Jesus isn't God, although they did realize that Jesus can be addressed as God and called a God. And they did that, more so than in the New Testament, especially by the end of the 100s. When we come back, what happened when Constantine died? Roman Catholic Church historian Leo Donald Davis, in his book The First Seven Ecumenical Councils, says this, quote, Upon Constantine the Great's death in 337, there occurred an act of violence more befitting the Turkish seraglio than a Christian court, with at least the knowledge of Constantius, the only son in Constantinople at the time, Constantine the Great's two half-brothers and six young princes of the blood were massacred by the army. Only two young cousins survived, Gallus and the future Emperor Julian. With this bloodletting, the will of Constantine was set aside, but the unity of the Constantinian dynasty secured. His three sons parceled out the empire among themselves. Constantine II, age 21, received Gaul, Britain, and Spain. Constantius II, 20, Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. Constans, only 14, Italy, Africa, and the Danubian provinces. Three years later, war broke out between Constantine II and Constans, who managed to defeat and execute his elder brother and occupy his provinces. As a result, Constans ruled the West, Constantius the East, from 340 on. End quote. So the bloody legacy continues. Constantine had executed various family members when he got nervous about his power being threatened or plots against him. And his three sons continue the slaughtering in order to keep hold of power for themselves. Eventually one kills the other. And now you've got co-emperors with an emperor ruling the West and an emperor ruling the East. Now, right around this time, around 340, 
the interesting character Athanasius starts to try to rally the troops in favor of the Creed of 325. So this is about 15 years later. What had happened in the meantime? Well, Athanasius had been kicked out of his position as Bishop of Alexandria, a very powerful and influential position with quite a lot of money even attached to it as well. He'd been kicked out of that position by a council at Tyre in 335. Why? Well, he would always argue that he was persecuted for doctrinal reasons, which seems like it's partly true. But he had many opponents who said that he was kicked out because of his dirty deeds done dirt cheap. Athanasius was an interesting piece of work. He's frequently cast as the hero in the story. I'll be honest, I see stubbornness there, but I wouldn't call the guy a hero. Have you ever met a really rabid, foaming-at-the-mouth Calvinist who just hates Arminians or any non-Calvinists and doesn't consider them to be Christians? This is not common, but you can find somebody like this, or a fundamentalist Baptist or someone like that. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing because as a Christian, you don't think Christians should hate anybody. And then here's this person just spewing hate and bile constantly. Athanasius was a guy like that. And if you read his books, you get pretty embarrassed and mortified by his mouth. And when you read him, you just have to decide at a certain point to laugh at it so it doesn't make you nuts. So he's constantly calling the Aryan madmen or fanatics. You know, he's saying they're mentally ill, disciples of Satan, they hate Christ, they're robbing Christ. One of Athanasius's translators, the famous Cardinal Newman, at one point gives a footnote where he sums up all the animal names that Athanasius calls his opponents, the so-called Arians. This is in the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers, second series, volume four on Athanasius, page 371. Newman has collected the following names. The Arians are dogs, hares, chameleons, hydras, eels, cuttlefish, gnats, beetles, and leeches. So at this time, Athanasius is exiled in Rome with some other people who had uh, been deposed, and he's being helped by the Bishop of Rome. He's starting to make his arguments, which some people even today find very persuasive, his long harangues against the Arians. And while Athanasius was in Rome, this happened. Again, Leo Donald Davis, page 82. At Pope Julius's invitation, Athanasius fled to Rome where he joined the other Nicene exiles, including Marcellus of Ancyra, whereupon in 340, Julius called a synod at Rome in the church of Vito, the former legate at Nicaea, in which he accepted a profession of faith from Marcellus and pronounced Athanasius the legitimate bishop of Alexandria. To the east, Julius addressed a dignified letter which revealed the Pope's consciousness of his authority. He asked why, contrary to custom, he had not been informed of what was occurring at Alexandria, notifying the eastern bishops that if any suspicion rested on the bishop there, notice ought to have been sent to the bishop of Rome. And the easterners failed to reply. End quote. What this Roman bishop's actions reflect is that during this time, bishops of big cities, important cities, and cities that had been important sites, like where martyrs died. So Peter and Paul were believed to have been martyred at Rome. Bishops of big and important cities thought that they were bigger and more important than other bishops. So he assembles a local synod, local gathering with just, you know, his peeps, and they reinstall Athanasius as against a guy named Gregory, who had been put in there after Athanasius was kicked out. Okay, so we have a situation with dueling meetings of bishops. One says that Athanasius can't be Bishop of Alexandria, and this one saying, oh yes, he can, and he is, so there. Church historian R.P.C. Hansen in his book, The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God, says on page 285, quote, There can be little doubt that this council of Antioch was conceived by those who organized it as an answer to Julius's council of Rome and the letter which he wrote to the Eusebian party after it and which must have been received in Antioch early in that year, end quote. So the Easterners were not going to just sit there and let the Bishop of Rome tell them what to do. And they weren't going to accept just any doctrinal pronouncement. Marcellus of Ancyra was a controversial figure. We don't have time in this episode to go into his views, but 
they had some objections to that. And so about 90 bishops in the year 341 got together in the important old city of Antioch. They had another excuse to be there at that time and place because the emperor Constantius had just built a new big church in Antioch, and so this was a meeting to dedicate it. He had come to Antioch to attend the dedication, and so he was there also to lend some weight to the council. Hansen says, quote, what he, that is the Emperor Constantius, probably had in mind was a desire to prevent bishops exceeding the rights and limits of their sees, as in his view Julius of Rome was doing, and interfering with the decisions of other bishops and of councils far removed from their proper sphere of influence, end quote. The Council of Antioch, then, was in a way a pushback against the Creed of Nicaea and its supporters by what I would call subordinationists. That's not what everybody calls them. I recently found a really good essay that covers this period. It's called Articulating Identity. It's by the theologian and church historian Lewis Ayers in a book called The Cambridge History of Early Christian Literature. And I'll put a link for this on the blog post. He says, quote, four broad theological traditions can be identified in the period 300 to 330, end quote. And then he proceeds to sketch these out. And so briefly, the first group is what he calls Eusebian theologies. So he's naming them after Eusebius of Caesarea and Eusebius of Nicomedia. These were subordinationist Catholics, in some sense kind of on the side of Arius, at one point, Eusebius of Nicomedia actually wrote in defense of Arius himself, but they didn't really see themselves as Arians, but rather as traditional mainstream Christians. I think it's perfectly fair to call them Eusebians because there were these two leading figures, both associated with the court of Constantine and very influential, and people who wrote influential things and influenced a lot of other bishops but on the other hand, it wasn't only these guys or people around them. They weren't the founders of this as a distinctive tradition. This was just a strain, a thread within Catholic thinking, which emphasized the difference between the Father and the Son. Many of them wanted to say that the Son is not made of the Father's substance, doesn't share a substance with him. The Son is like the Father. But as Eusebius of Nicomedia says at one point, the Son is, quote, altogether distinct in his nature and in his power, end quote. A second strain within the mainstream Catholic thinking is that of Alexander of Alexandria. This was the one who brought the case against Arius and his supporters. And these, Ayers says, quote, spoke very strongly of the eternal co-relativity of father and son, end quote. So the father is eternally a father, so he must eternally have a son, and the son, of course, must have a father. So this is a reason, a little thought, which leads to emphasizing that there was never a time when the son was not. And so this way of thinking tends to be hostile to thinking that the son could be divine in a lesser sense, although I'm not at all sure that it ruled out that the son is in any way lesser than the father. The third trajectory Ayers discusses is that of Marcellus of Ancyra, Ayers says that this theology was somewhat close to Sabellian or modalist theology, the monarchians of the third century, where God and God's word are similar to a man and man's word. So then the word is just an activity or a property or power of the speaker. And Marcellus also apparently seized on this interesting passage in Paul, which is 1 Corinthians 15.28. Paul here talks about the kingdom of Jesus being, in some sense, handed back or subjected to the Father. 
And so if he's thinking of Jesus as just a word spoken out of the Father, then the word could, so to speak, cease or go back in to within the Father. And so it's not clear that he's going to have the Logos as eternally alongside God in both past and future. Of course, at this point in time, Marcellus is on the Nicene side. He's on Athanasius' side. The fourth trajectory is just Western theology, that is, Latin-speaking theology, and it seems less developed, and Ayer says it's kind of hard to characterize it. He mentions Tertullian and Ovation, and I think this comment of Ayer's is accurate. On page 425, he says, quote, The Father, who has no origin, necessarily precedes the Son, and the Son, who is also God, receives his being only from the Father, who is the one God. End quote. So he's discussing novation there. In some sense, the Father is before the Son, whether temporally or just uh, metaphysically before him. And the Son is emanated out of God in some way from him or his being as a means of producing the universe. And he says that they emphasize the son's dependence on the father and the son's origin in the father, although they tend to describe the son as having the father's power or the same kind of power, one of the two. So mind you, this is all within the mainstream of Catholic thinking, small c Catholic, the kind of mainstream Christianity which had come to be ruled by bishops in each city. When we come back, what happened at the council? What happened at the Council of Antioch in the year 341? We really don't know. So that's that. But we do have a couple of interesting statements from it. First, they produced a creed, which RPC Hansen describes as, quote, a colorless and innocuous statement, interesting only for two points. Here is one of the interesting parts of that creed. We have neither been followers of Arius, because how should we who are bishops follow a presbyter? Nor have we accepted any other form of faith than that which was set out at the beginning, but we have rather approached him as investigators and judges of his belief than followed him. These bishops then realize that their opponents are starting to lump them in with Arius and to pillory them as Arians. And of course this is ludicrous because their bishops and Arius was a presbyter who had a, his own bishop over him. This is like saying that generals are following some sergeant, and that just can't be. And so it's a ludicrous charge. This is why I don't use the term Arians, unless I preface it by the word so-called and put quotation marks around the word. The so-called Arians were so-called by Athanasius. This was his way of viciously slandering them as disciples of Arius, followers after some new heresy, in the style of the Marcionites who followed Marcion and uh, the Valentinians who followed Valentinus and people like that. And it was a vicious slander. There was really nothing to it. True, Arius had influenced some people and some had come to his defense, but he was not the founder of a party and not really the leader of a party. And they took umbrage at being described in this way and rightfully so. So I usually don't use the term Arians for the same reasons I don't call Republicans fascists, and I don't call Democrats communists, and I don't call feminists feminazis like Rush Limbaugh. And it's not because I agree with all these people, it's just we need a good neutral descriptive term. So I wouldn't call these council documents Aryan creeds in any interesting sense. Arius has died, he's out of the picture now, and in truth he was never the leader of the party anyway. This kind of subordinationism long preceded Arius and wasn't founded on his teaching. Also, they disagreed with some elements of it that were considered extreme at the time, as we'll see. 
So that's the first interesting point. They just disavow Arius. They're not Arians. It's just slander. The reason Athanasius did it is because Arius had been deposed by this council presided over by the emperor. And so to call these people Arians and Ariomaniacs was a way of trying to cut them down. The other interesting thing that Hansen observes about this creed is that at one point it says that Christ will remain king and God forever. And so this is contradicting Marcellus's idea that somehow the Son will cease to rule and he'll hand it all back to God. Maybe the Son will even go back to being God's internal logos or something like that. Right. This is a point that probably most Christians, whatever their precise Christology, would agree with. The kingdom can still be handed over to God or given back to God, and yet Christ could still be in the administration of it. So it's not like there's no reason for Christ to exist as an individual after he has finished getting rid of all opposition and taking charge of the world and putting it in the right order. Then for some reason, this same council came out with another creed, this one longer and more carefully composed. And Hansen says about it, quote, It can hardly be regarded as either a supplement to the Nicene Creed or an interpretation of it. It is put forward as a substitute. End quote. This creed came to be called the Dedication Creed because, as I mentioned, this council was convened to dedicate this new church built in Antioch. So let's listen to this creed in full. The Second Creed of Antioch, also called the Dedication Creed. Following the evangelical and apostolic tradition, we believe in one God, Father Almighty, artificer and maker and designer of the universe, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, God through whom are all things, who was begotten from the Father before the ages, God from God, whole from whole, soul from soul, perfect from perfect, king from king, lord from lord, living wisdom, true light, way, truth, unchanging and unaltering, exact image of the Godhead, and the substance and will and power and glory of the Father, firstborn of all creation, who was in the beginning with God, God the Word, who at the end of the days came down from above and was born of a virgin, and became man, mediator between God and men, the apostle of our faith, author of life, who suffered for us and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and is coming again with glory and power to judge the living and the dead. And in the Holy Spirit, who is given to those who believe for comfort and sanctification and perfection, just as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded his disciples, obviously in the name of the Father, who is really Father, and the Son, who is really Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is really Holy Spirit, because the names are not given lightly or idly, but signify exactly the particular hypostasis and order and glory of each of those who are named, so that they are three in hypostasis, but one in agreement. Since we hold this belief and have held it from the beginning to the end, before God and Christ we condemn every form of heretical unorthodoxy. And if anybody teaches contrary to the sound, right faith of the Scriptures, alleging that either time, or occasion, or age exists, or did exist before the Son was begotten, let him be anathema. And if anyone alleges that the Son is a creature like one of the creatures, or a product like one of the products, or something made like one of the things that are made, and not as the Holy Scriptures have handed down concerning the subjects which have been treated one after another, or if anyone teaches or preaches anything apart from what we have laid down, let him be anathema. For we believe and follow everything that has been delivered from the Holy Scriptures by the prophets and apostles, truly and reverently. Hansen makes many interesting observations about this creed. For one thing, it's not anti-Marcellan, doesn't have any explicit statement about Christ's kingdom enduring forever. That's interesting. It is strongly anti sabellian It says that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three in hypostasis. In other words, they're three beings. That's what that meant at the time. And then it adds, but they're one in agreement. So they're three beings, each with a will, and they can be in one accord. 
They can agree together and presumably work together. Is it Aryan? No, not at all for the reasons I mentioned. But it's also not Aryan because Aryans would not have accepted that the Son is the exact image of the substance of the deity of the Father. They would have been okay with the suggestion that the Son is not a creature like one of the other creatures because that leaves it open to believe that he is a creature. What about the Aryan claim, or at least what was alleged to be the Aryan claim, that there was a time when the Son was not? The Creed seems to rule that out, saying that he was begotten before the ages. So if it was before the ages, this is a way of kind of saying in eternity, and there wouldn't have been a time when the Son was not. Calls him God from God, but it doesn't call him true God. He's not God himself, Jesus. He's the mediator, it says, between God and man. And it's easy to see why it wouldn't want to call Jesus true God. The reason would be that in John chapter 17, we have Jesus praying to God, and he seems to imply that the Father is the one true God. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So if the Father is the one true God, then, well, no one else is. So they would traditionally, at this time, describe Jesus as, quote, God, but not as true God. They start off by confessing, as in earlier creeds, belief in one God. Who's that? It's the Father Almighty. And they also, right in the middle of the creed, quote this famous passage from Paul's first letter to Timothy. There is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. So is Jesus God himself on this creed? Absolutely not. On the other hand, it's not at all Arian. It has some elements that express traditional subordinationism. It avoids saying that Father and Son are homoousion, that is one substance. Although it does say something that sounds a little bit like that, the Son is the exact image of the substance of the deity of the Father. Right, but it's not controversial to say that the Son of God is like God. Any Christian will agree with that. All in all, what this creed is, is a conservative pushback against a new language introduced at Nicaea. Hansen, on page 290, says, quote, It represents the nearest approach we can make to discovering the views of the ordinary educated Eastern bishop, who was no admirer of the extreme views of Arius, but who would have been shocked and disturbed by the apparent Sabellianism of the Nicene Creed and the insensitiveness of the Western Church to the threat to orthodoxy which this tendency represented. And then skipping a bit, he mentions a silent majority who he says, quote, constituted a widespread point of view, but we can hardly call them a party, end quote. When we come back, what about talk of a third and a fourth creed from this council at Antioch in the year 341? If you look in books of church history, they'll mention a third creed of the Antiochene Council and a fourth creed. And the third creed isn't really a creed in the same sense. It's not a document composed by the bishops. It's rather a document composed by one bishop who had been accused of Sabellianism or holding views like Marcellus of Ancyra. And it's just him. Somehow this gets to be called the third creed from the council, but it's not. 
Is there a fourth creed of Antioch? Maybe, maybe not. We'll hear about that in the next Trinities podcast. This week's thinking music has been You Um, I'll Ah by Dr. Turtle. You can listen to or download this track at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Do you enjoy listening to the Trinities podcast? There are four ways you can show us some love in return. First, share the blog post for this episode on whatever social media you use, such as Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, or Google+. Second, you can leave us a rating and a brief review in the iTunes store and at Stitcher. For step-by-step directions on how to do this, visit trinities.org slash blog slash review. Doing this will help other people who are interested in theology to find this podcast. Third, you can donate to the cause by clicking the orange donate buttons to the right of any blog post. Do you think these episodes are worth a quarter apiece? If so, you can donate a dollar each month via PayPal. And of course, any one-time gift is much appreciated. Fourth, you can send us some brief, to-the-point audio feedback for possible incorporation into a future episode. We would love to hear your question or your comment in your voice. The upload link for your audio file is on the blog post for any episode. To sum up, you can share, rate, donate, and talk back. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>